Good day everyone, this is Matt Koopmans from Aurelium Group, this is an episode of Trailblazers and Pathfinders and today we're speaking with Martin Rogers from Realize Business. Martin, pleasure seeing you. Oh, likewise. Well, thanks, very Matt. welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it's very good. Now, so you're the CEO of Realize Business. Can you tell a little bit about uh, yourself, the company and you know, your purpose in, in doing that? Yeah, look, thanks Matt. So Realize Business is a not-for-profit organisation and been around for over 30 years. The whole role of Realise Business is actually to help anyone in small business on their journey because whether you think about starting a business, you want to grow your business, you might want to optimise your business or actually you might want to exit your business and the whole idea of working with people uh, from a point of view in their their small business on their journey. It's done in a way with a number of advisors. I came into the role as a CEO now about half a year ago and it's an interesting thing for me around the term business people. And say, oh, we're here with a gathering of business people. I actually would like to start, start to think about, can we reimagine that term? Rather than say that we are business people, to actually say we're not just business people, we're actually people in business. Because the person behind the business, especially in small business, is just as important as the business itself. The journey of a small business is a person with an idea, wanting to start that and grow that business to whatever that might be. And, and at Realised Business, the aim is to help them on that journey. Not necessarily doing it for them, but to do it with them. And one of the things that's nice is that each of our advisors, and we have a number of different advisors, they could be generalists, or they could be functional specialists in the terms of, say, digital, or marketing, or finance, or we could have industry specialists as well. And so depending on where a person is in their business stage, we'll work with them on that journey. But it's working with the person and their business. And that's what puts Realised Business apart, is that we'll actually not just be a video on a screen, we're actually working with you to understand you. And what's nice about our advisors is every one of them has actually been in small business themselves. Mm -hmm. So actually, your advisors have lived the same journey. They became successful and started saying, hey, let's give back to something. Now, what do you see as common traits within business people that you actually see in Realised Business coming through? Like, what is the trends, not only in the type of business that they do, but also what's the personal traits? Like, hey, that's kind of a commonality between success and, you know, the, the ones that try really hard but never really get there. Is there is there a commonality in there? What's interesting is you see everyone coming in with a great passion. They've got a great idea and they want to achieve something. It doesn't always happen in the right time frame or the, or the right succession. They want to do it all now and get it all done really, really quickly. Um, one of the things in small business is a, re- is a real challenge is how do you get it all done? I wear all the hats in terms mm. of that from a small business perspective. And one of the things that's interesting is if you look at it, I like to say a lot of people have a lot of discussions, even whether it be in business or whether it be in personal. We have a lot of discussions and then you'll make some decisions and I'm going to do it and then you get distracted. Mm-hmm. Big New Year's resolutions. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm going to have discussions. <laughs> I'll make a decision. I'm going to get fit. And then you get distracted and go back to normal life. Mm. Or what happens is people make, have some discussions and they make some decisions, but they don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Like I know that I've made this, but how do I get it sort of done? So in reality, the real key to success in a lot of these things is having that great passion, that idea, but knowing that have the discussions, make decisions, but we've got to get it done. Mm-hmm. We've got to get it implemented in your business. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting if I look at if we're working with people in small business, sometimes we'll go and talk to them. So you've got your business. That's what you do really, really well. And you do that 40, 50, 60 hours a week then you've got to put the hat on as the business owner and try and grow the business. And so from a psychological point of view, it's almost like saying to people, in order to be a business owner in your small business, you've got to get a part-time job. And that part-time job is as a small business owner. And so you go to your diary and you work out where that's going to fit. Because what's interesting is if you look at how many hours there are in a week, there's 24 times seven, so there's 168 hours in the week. Everyone in life, is full, overflowing even. So the real interesting thing here is to be that part-time job as a business owner, you actually have to quit something. You have to look at your 168 hours and say, this is my life, this is what I do now. If I'm going to have that part-time job as a business owner two hours a week, what am I going to quit? And you've got to make that conscious decision and say, I'm giving that up 
to invest in being the business owner. Because it's difficult to find it in your 40, 50, 60 hours that you're doing the business. So the conscious decision in your diary to say, that's when I'm working on the business, I know that I'm quitting that to make the time. Mm -hmm. And so for me, what's important is to get things done and not get distracted is you have to work out the time and be committed to the routine of doing that. It's not about what you do, it's having the time available to say, I'm going to do that in my business. And to me, that's a key thing Mm -hmm. to help businesses grow. Yeah, you mentioned actually two things, right? So the first one is obviously, is decide, right? You have to make a decision um, and decide if you come back to the etymology of the word, uh, is to cut off, right? It's actually saying, this is what I'm not going to do. And the other thing is you mentioned is very interesting because I don't see that only in small business, but it's actually in corporates very, very big, which is called ADOS, attention deficit. Ooh, shiny, right? It's the next big shiny object before, before this one thing is, is uh, finished. Um, as a small business, and, and you, you know, going back to your history as well, you have some corporate work as well, and there's a big difference there. What I noticed is that in small business with our clients, they can't afford not to finish something because if they keep doing things and not finishing them, then guess what's going to happen, right? They're just the cash runs out. Um, so from your history, how, how did you end up with Realized Business? So you started as CEO. Uh, where did you come before that and before that? What's your journey and what are the inflection points in your career, in your life that if you go back and think about like, hey, if I didn't make that decision, I wouldn't be here today doing what I do, doing what I love and, and leaving behind what, what I think is, is valuable. It's a, it's a great point. And to me, it's always looking at this opportunity of what's next, have a look at it and, and have a go in terms of where that sits. So I started uh, back, as you mentioned, at Unilever. I was fortunate enough to be selected to Unilever to be on their management trainee scheme. And I went through that and it was great. They, they did a lot of training. And I was blessed by the fact that someone invested so much time in me to be a better me which is what's really nice. So over three years, I got all this training. And the, it, then came the opportunity to say, well, do I continue down the corporate path where that sits, which is a wonderful path to go down, or I had this opportunity to go into small business. And I think I'm probably always a little bit entrepreneurial. Uh, the whole idea, that shiny object is a big, <laughs> a big issue, uh, a new opportunity, and always seeing the best in these things and what could that do? Can it change the world? Can it do all these types of things? And I had the opportunity to go into small business with my brother. And so we did that. And that started the small business journey to where I am now at, at Realized Business. And, it's, and I'm grateful for that. And why am I grateful for that, especially when it comes to looking at business? In the corporate world, you, you might grow in an area of, of business. It could be in finance. It could be in operations. In small business, you get exposure to all of them straight up. Not to the same level and scale as you do in the corporate world, but you get a good balanced view of what it takes actually to run a business, all a large business is, is a small business at scale mm-hmm. in terms of where that sits. So that started my small business journey and I had a few inflection points along the way. But the real thing that's interesting is to, to look at it and just have a feeling saying, yeah, does that something that I want to go? And things might have a, a tenure or an end to it. And so I've been able to do a number of different things on my small business journey, which has now allowed me to, to be here as a CEO of Realized Business. And what I like about it is it allows me to understand, you know, have a bit of empathy towards the journey of, of small business. It's a it's a challenging time for some people in, the, in those areas. Uh, being able to walk alongside them and help them when they're low, but also help them celebrate when they've achieved some of those successes. So that's sort of, I started back in corporate, had a few opportunities of different businesses, and now I'm here at, at Realize. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting that you mentioned certain inflection points, right? So my personal history as well is like, you know, corporates and small business, et cetera. Um, there's, for me, if there's one decision I didn't make, for instance, have the opportunity to go for a number of years in Saudi Arabia, I wouldn't be here. It's very simple. Um, if you if you look back, like, what decision for you? If you just could pick one point in your life, like if I did not make that decision, or whether that's Unilever, or if that's actually changing your um, education background, right? because you started out with you know chemistry and then came to like hey, let's do commerce. Like obviously that's the next thing you do when you finish with <laughs> chemistry. <laughs> um, so if you look back, can you name if you were to nominate one single moment in your life, like that's pivotal to where I am right now. Now, obviously, every decision is, but one thing that comes into mind. Oh, look, I think at the end of the day, the, the bit, well, a couple of things, if you think about where it sits, was the opportunity where, where mm-hmm. I went to university. I was, I was fortunate enough to be on a cooperative scholarship scheme with the University of New South Wales and went through the recruitment process and Unilever picked me up. So it was, it was great getting that phone call saying, hey, would you like to be working at Unilever? I said, yeah, wonderful, yes, I would. And, and I went through that journey. So I think the pivotal moment, the real pivotal moment, mm-hmm. was my when my brother phoned me and said, 
I bought a business. Do you want in? <laughs> and that was the point that said, I'm going down small business. If that hadn't have happened, then there's a chance I would have stayed in the corporate structure, would have gone down that corporate pathway. Right. So that was probably the defining moment back in, it was probably, I think it was 2000, back end of year 2000. Right. Around then is when that happened. And so that, that fundamentally set me on a, on a different path. And that was the point that then sent me on my small business journey, which was about getting involved. So I'll always be inquisitive, always having ideas, always wanting to have a go. But it just it took me from a corporate setting into the small business space for the last 20 plus years, right. the small business journey. And along the way, there's been different iterations. And what's really interesting is this whole idea that we make decisions being decisive. And so that's one of the things we don't do in life enough of. Mm. We don't actually make decisions. And if we can be decisive and say, is that for me? No, move on. If it is for me, then make a decision and take it. This whole idea of procrastination or I'm going to, and someone says to me, oh, I was going to do that. Well, <laughs> you were going to, you didn't do it. The successful people are the ones who actually take it, make that decision and then do it and implement it. It's okay to incubate. So sometimes we've got to sit there and let ideas incubate and grow, but don't procrastinate. And that's the big difference. Mm. It's okay to let an idea grow, but if you can't make a decision, you'll never get ahead. Yeah. The, the key motivation for procrastination is, is in my view, it's, it's fear. It's a fear of the unknown. I don't know what's going to happen. What if something goes wrong and that is always going to, you know, you don't know what the future holds. Um, I always say that, you know, working for a large corporate is actually the most risky business decision you can ever make because you only have one client and they, can, they will survive without you, yes. right? Whereas a small business, you've got many clients. And if you do it well, um, and I always look at it like you do things that you love, that's great. That's a hobby. You do things that you're good at, that's a hobby where you can excel. And then if you do things that you love, good at, and people are willing to pay for you, doing something valuable and you yeah. build yourself a, a you know, sustainable business. Um, interesting, you mentioned you started the business in 2000. Now, obviously, 2001 um, happened. So we had um, obviously 9-11 had an impact on the economy. We had the dot-com bubble that came actually 2001 all the way through to 2002. How did that impact your perception? Like, did I make the right choice? Is this the right thing for me? Because obviously, as a small business, your exposure is less co in your control on that. Or is it more? I mean, how, how was your um, perception of that time when we went through that? It was, it's a good question you asked. It was an interesting time for the world. For me, though, it was interesting because I was only young. Mm -hmm. I was only starting my journey. So I wasn't aware and didn't have the wisdom to think how would that impact me. So we're just getting in and just did it. Just went in and, and did the business and doing those type of things. And I remember, I still remember 9-11 uh, and I was sitting there, actually it was late at night in, in here and I was watching Sandra Sully was on Channel 10 and it came through and said a plane had hit the building. And so I looked at it from the point of view that was a, a, a big problem for the world. Did I connect it saying would that be a big problem for my business? Not necessarily because I was still young. I'm in my 20s. And I'm like, okay, well, let's have a look. at. We just went out and did, did, did. I remember going out doing quotes from security aspects and bits and pieces. And there I'm in the lounge rooms or uh, places and there it is on the TV. But I'm still doing the business. Mm -hmm. um, so I probably didn't have the idea. I probably didn't have the awareness of the macro geopolitical impacts of the world versus in small business, just get in and I just do it. So I was fortunate that how it wasn't 20 or 30 years in business. I was only young and I was still driving towards, let's just get into the business, let's build it and let's grow yeah. from that point of view. Yeah. Now it's different. Now you probably take a bit more of a view of what does it mean from a geopolitical point. Does that make you more risk averse? I'm not sure. Um, maybe sometimes being young and naive <laughs> in business and having a go, you just and, and a number of the businesses that we've done have been like that. We jump in and just, just have a go. I remember when we did our uh, the whole idea of a Poppy Park aspect. Mm -hmm. that was, that's a real interesting uh, story. We'd sold one of our our businesses and it, our father, uh, who we, we learned a lot of great things from, he served in the Navy for almost 30 years and we were, would go to the dawn service and with him and, and the dawn service and you'd have the minute silence. And we're, during the minute silence we were doing that and, and one time we, we were having a chat and we said, we're here at the minute silence, we've got no one to remember. We don't have anyone dying in the world wars or anything like that. And mum in 2014, back in the 2014, he said, actually, you did. You had two great-great-uncles that passed away on the Western Front. And both my brother Owen and myself said, oh, wow, we didn't know that. We'd forgotten about them. Mm -hmm. They'd given their lives for the freedom we have and we'd forgotten about them. 
We weren't remembering to do the minute silence. So what did we do? We jumped on a plane and we flew over to Belgium and France. We went and visited their, their resting places. And whilst we were there, we said, who else has been forgotten? There's 100 and two, at the time, there were 102,804 names on the Australian War Memorial who'd given their lives for the freedom in Australia. So what can we do to remember our uncles and also honour them? Mm-hmm. This is the back end of 2014 and we've got the centenary of Anzac coming up in 2015 in, in April, only 10, 12 weeks away. Mm-hmm. We said, what can we do? So, well, why don't we create a poppy and put their name on it? Let's not just do it for Herbert and Claude. Let's do it for all 102,804 of those names. And let's create a giant poppy to, me- to commemorate them at the, for the centenary of Anzac. So you've got 10 weeks to make this happen. Most people would go, oh, you're not going to get planning through in that time. But we made the decision to honour them. So we got in and said, how can we do it? So we, we came back, we flew back in. And I remember we, talk, we talked to the press, uh, Channel 7, uh, the Penrith Press at the time as well, said, yes, we'll get behind this story. We'll, we'll, do some, we'll do that type of act. We'll do some news stories for you. And we started building some momentum around it. So in 10 weeks, we were able to get a number of volunteers and we built this poppy park. And it had 102,804 names on it. And we thought that's going to honour um, our uncles. And we thought we might have a couple of people come <laughs> along and turn up. So we've got a little gazebo. It was a little three-by-three three gazebo. We thought we'd just stand there just so the sun didn't get on us. And interestingly enough, by the end of the – it opened up and we had a RAF uh, flyover yeah. with the Herx. And over the course of six weeks it was open, we had 50,000 people come through. And look, we had the Premier come through. We had the Governor of New South Wales come through. And so it was all, and when you look at it and look back on it, it wasn't the fact that we had an idea. It was the fact that our idea, we made a decision, and we were able to fortune to have 1,500 volunteers come along and participate in building this great commemoration. So, so what I say, sometimes the fear, as you mentioned, maybe procrastination or it's not going to work, doesn't make it happen, mm-hmm. versus what do we need to do to make it happen? Yeah. And that's what we did and got in and made a great so, success. So you're in the beginning of this, but hey, let's have this idea, right? Let, let's go do this because it's, it's you know, something that is valuable. It's something that, you know, we want to give back to the community and, and, and actually, you know, create a legacy for yes. all those people. Um, anyone talking to you at that moment was like, oh, you're completely insane. Why would you do this? You can never do this. So you actually did the, what a lot of people say, the impossible. Um, how did you get... I mean, obviously, yourself and, and you know, the initi- initiative takers have to focus, right? This is what I want to do, and let's focus. And focus means this is what I'm going to focus on, and the rest, I just don't even see it. I don't hear it. But with all these volunteers, how did you get them with the same purpose and the same focus so that everyone is going into the same direction, no matter what role they play? It's, it's a good point. Now, it's an interesting thing. Someone said to me, and it's always resonated with me, that they say when you die, you die three times. The first time you die is when you physically die. Mm -hmm. The second time is when people say goodbye to you at your funeral. And the third time is when your name is spoken for the last time. So if we can ensure that at every Anzac Day, Remembrance Day, that that person's name is spoken, they'll never be forgotten and never be spoken for the last time. So the overriding message is let's not forget these people. And so people who came and, and got enrolled, they brought their families, their young kids. And what, when it came to building the poppy, it was a case of here's a few for you to go and plant in the ground. And they would take time and they'd look at them, they'd read the names and they'd, they'd place it in. So the whole point of it, of Poppy Park and even Remembrance, is to ensure that every single individual name is never forgotten. So if you have that overriding message, and that's that whole, if people got passion and purpose... They'll drive through to say, how do I make this happen? It's because they're doing it for a different reason. It's not for money, it's it's just for a purpose and that's the drive. And basically we just said to people, this is what we're aiming to achieve. And being open to change. So when we said how we're going to do it and ideas, so we just said we've got an idea, we want to do it. And then other people gave different ideas on how we might do it, how we might build it, how we might make stuff. Then we built these poppies and we had 102,804 red ones and someone said, well, what about the animals? We said, oh, good idea. They said, I said, well, that should be. They said, well, that's a purple one. I said, cool. I said, can you make one? 
So they made a purple one. Right. And in the centerpiece, <laughs> we put a purple poppy that was for, for the animals. And I think this is the whole idea, is that you've got to be able to open up and the idea becomes the community's idea. And the community builds it and other people grow it. You can't hold on to it. You might have started it, but let others build it and flourish. And that's where it will chop and change and be open to flexibility. And if that happens, especially in business, um, you'll have success. Mm. So you mentioned like hey, the, the third time you die is when people stop remembering your name. Your name is spoken for the last time. Um, so we're looking at legacy here. Now we're looking here at legacy for you know, NZACs and, and uh, soldiers that fall to our freedom. And obviously they deserve you know, the legacy. They deserve their name to be spoken. Um, how do you see that in what we're actually building with small businesses? Because in the end, we can't take it with us, right? Ultimately, you know, we're going to lose the life that we have. We're going to grow older, but is what we're building enduring? How do you see the parallel between business purpose and legacy um, and the story you just told? Is there, some, is there a parallel? Should there be a parallel? Look, it's, uh, there may be. There may not be. It depends on the intent. And it's interesting around the whole idea of, of legacy and why are you doing stuff or why are we doing business? So if I go back to the whole idea of why am I doing business, why am I doing it the way I like to do it? John Maxwell um, has written a number of books. He's a, mm-hmm. I think he was a pastor and now he's a leadership expert. And he was recalling this story and it really resonated with me around he went and he was going to be a pastor in a church and he wrote on the board, I want to make a difference. So he said, there, great, I've got my reason and my purpose and off I go. So he went out and he said, I can't do it. Can't do it by myself. Mm -hmm. So he rubbed it off. And he said, actually, what I do, I need to actually have people. So... He said, all right, I'm going to go and write it. So he said, I want to make a difference with people who want to make a difference. He said, I've got it. So then he went out and he rolled the team and that was his purpose and that's where it goes from there. And he said, you can't do it. It doesn't work because people have got ulterior motives. And And then he worked out and he he said, okay, the whole idea of where it is, he went and rewrote it. He said, I've got it. He said, actually, I want to make a difference with people who want to make a difference doing something together that actually makes a difference. And that then becomes that whole legacy of of enrolling stuff, which is a case of saying it's not about me, it's about us making a difference. And if we make the difference enough, I believe that's what resonates. Because you you go back to legacy and where here we are, 2023, and and recalling with you before around, if we went back 150 years to 1873 and said, can you tell me someone in your family who you still recall today? And chances are people may not do that. might be hard. might be difficult. So if I say, okay, here we are in 2023 and we move forward to two, another 150 years to 2173, what can I do today that people will be talking about in 150 years' time? Mm-hmm. Can I really control that? Maybe I can, maybe I can't. Can I actually leave it? I can attempt to leave a legacy. But if I look at the reasons and the people we might talk about, so let's take Bradfield with the Harbour Bridge and stuff like, like that. You know, when you look at it, in a sense, he maybe didn't start out to say, I want to be spoken about in 100 years' time. What he was doing was saying, I want to solve a problem for today and I want to make a difference in someone's life enough that it resonates with them. They want to talk about me. So when I look at anything in business, I necessarily can't create a legacy what my focus is is to make enough of a difference in someone's life that they go, wow, that was impactful, that I'll also continue that story. Because you think about it, in living memory, you and I interact with. Yeah. Um, I move on, you're still alive. <laughs> the stories you tell about the person that was alive are the ones that will then transfer to the next generation and so on mm-hmm. and so forth. Mm-hmm. So to me, you don't have to focus about 150 years' time. It's about making sure that I'm having great conversations and meaningful connections with the people that I have in my life today, enough so that they want to talk about it when I'm not around. And it might be this podcast or whatever we're having a better look at. But to me, and that's if we want to think about in business, it's not about necessarily creating a legacy, but everything we do in business, as we mentioned, people in business, if we do it with a view to actually want to truly help the customers and others within the business then we might be creating something of a legacy that people want to talk about and we can pass on and it can move on into the future and be remembered. Yeah. Yeah, so from from my perspective, right, obviously you work with large teams and small teams. Currently we are a small team, team of five. 
um, we have a common purpose. And I believe in life, as it is in business, right? In life, our purpose here on this planet in the time that we're here is to make it a little bit better for someone else. Yeah. You know, it's a positive impact on, on others. With a business, we need to make sure that the people that buy stuff from us are doing better or are getting better in doing things for their clients, so make their lives a little bit better. Um, that gives a common purpose and a common direction. Now, whether or not the name that I have is remembered in 150 years, um, Sometimes you say, I hope not, because really bad people get remind, remembered as well. <laughs> but it's it's um, you making it better for other people. And people don't uh, they forget what they what you do to them, but they never forget how you make them feel. Uh, that's another thing in, in, in business as well as in personal. Um, bad things happen, challenges happen in the business. It's how you deal with them. Um, and if you have that common purpose, and sometimes you, know, you need to remind people like, hey, this is our purpose um, and I will say to you know my staff as well as before, the purpose is not necessarily making money. It's very easy to make money. The purpose is to do something so well that you know money is just a consequence of your work that you're doing. But you need to set your targets well. So for instance, in corporates, what I noticed is because everything gets so micro targets, right? You get little ta- micro targets like individual utilization, which is if you're in the services business, like how many hours do you bill per week? then the consequence of that is, okay, that's how I'm going to be measured. I'm not going to solve any problems for my client because then I will be redundant, right? So it's like, don't solve the problem too fast. And if you really do things well, then your utilization is a consequence because, hey, you solve my problems. I want more of that. I want more of you. Come back here, do more projects. So as a business, I look at it like, is growth your purpose? Is profit your purpose? Is customer loyalty your purpose? is um, just making, and customer loyalty means constantly making positive impact on how your clients operate. And if your client is an end user, right, a consumer, is how you make them feel consuming your product. Um, it just goes back to that. That's, to me, the, the filter is I want to make a difference with people who want to make a difference, doing something together that actually makes a difference. Yeah. And if it, if it can't be together and actually make a difference, then the real question would be, should I be doing it? So that's the guiding principle. Am I making a difference? And what's interesting in in where we look at it, it's, it's not only am I making different a difference to the customers of the business, am I making a difference to those that I work with in the business as well? And I've got to take that philosophy along as well. It's it's got to be a positive difference in that right way, and that mm-hmm. becomes the that's that guiding principle, and that's that filter, and you sort of get the gut feeling, go yeah. And so with realized business, I believe we're doing that. Mm-hmm. So I want to make a difference. With all the advisors and coaches who want to make a difference, <laughs> where together we're actually making a difference in the lives of those small businesses. Because when it comes to small businesses, it's not just the business you take on and make an impact on. It's the whole of life because it's so intertwined. The family unit and the business often in small business is intertwined. It's, it's one and the same thing. So that's why I think you can actually make a real positive difference in the lives of small yeah. business owners and their family. I think a key observation is um, we talk about small business community. Yeah. We never talk about corporate community. We talk about small business community and there's the corporate institutions. Um, and I think that is indeed, you don't go in business with yourself, you go in business with your partner, yeah. right? So if you're you know, married and family, they actually are part of your business as well, even though they may not be part of your business, they're part yeah. of your business, is part of you. What do you think, so... Coming, and we talked earlier uh, when you started the business. Um, and it's like, hey, that's that's this is a great time. It's two thousand. Everything is booming, and then obviously everything turned out a little bit more challenging. What is your message for people that are right now either just starting a business or thinking about it, or are in business and feeling that that pinch? Like, hey, wait a minute, things are actually now becoming more challenging. Um, what is your advice and recommendation for those to actually weather this storm? Because ultimately, we will weather this storm. Look, it's, it is interesting. I think all I, I say, if someone's trying to to get into starting looking at starting a business or someone is already in business, the number one thing is having a, a sounding board. That's that's fundamental. Um, you can use a coach, you can use a friend, whatever. It's someone who you, who you would trust has got wisdom to be able to be a reflection of that sounding board. Sometimes I, I say you almost need unreasonable friends. <laughs> you know, some people that listen to your excuses but won't accept them because um, sometimes we, it's, it's great you want to get it done in business. But to me, having having a guide of some kind, whatever, however you get that guide, it could be 
a personal guide. It could be through books. It could be through yeah. podcasts like this or whatever. But but have that opportunity to talk with someone who's got more wisdom that has walked the journey uh, before you have and to say, well, look, maybe you want to take this step. So that they've walked through the minefield. They know where not to step and they know where to. They might know the shortcuts. Um, so the key is, is I say in, in anyone in business is don't try and do it yourself because business can be very, very lonely at the top because as a small business owner, you're meant to know it all. Mm-hmm. You go, oh, I've got to know all this stuff. And then the best thing is for you to say that um, I don't necessarily know it all. You know, I look at it from the point of view of if you think about good business principles, I use a, a very simple uh, three types of judgment, which is basic awareness, working knowledge or leading edge. You know, where are you at with that? What does that mean? So if we take an accounting principle, basic awareness would be can I read a P&L or a balance sheet? Working knowledge is can I enter the data? into MYB or Zero or my accounting package. Leading edge is I'm developing the next version of that accounting package. So in everyone's business, what you're doing, the working knowledge is what you do. You could be the plumber, that's where you're working knowledge. It's the basic awareness stuff that you might need help because that's not what you do, that's not what your business is. You're not the accountant, you're the plumber. So to me, a good business is knowing that and saying, okay, well, I'm good at this. That's what I give my customers. But all those other functions of business, hmm, I don't necessarily know it all. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go and engage with people that can teach me with that or I can connect with them and they can provide that service to my business. So together across all functions of business, you have working knowledge or leading edge. And then you've got a real good business. But that takes you to sit, so it takes you understand that you don't need to know it all and you probably shouldn't. You're not going to be the best at every part of your business. What you're going to be the best at is the stuff that people pay you to do. And so for me, anyone in business who wants to, if you want to get into business, yes, have a look at it. You know, we, we run some things called Start a Business Course, which actually allows you to validate, actually, should I get into business? Some people go through that workshop and go, actually, you know what? Not for me. I'm going to go back and get a job. Um, <laughs> yeah. If you get through those, those areas and then you challenge yourself to go to the next level, listen to the wise words, but also sometimes think about it and say, actually, why is that person giving me that advice? Is it because they don't want to do it and mm. they wouldn't do it and they're scared or is it because there's really something to think about and do? Yeah. So my view is get in and have a go. It's great. I mean that's what business is all about. And if it's, a, if it's a passion and a purpose of yours, it's how do you then look to monetize that? I would just say do it with a guide so they can help you along that journey. Whether you're in business, whether you're thinking about starting your business, having a sounding board is very beneficial. Yeah. I think you actually hit on something here, right? So obviously in our business, we do you know, IT management and managed services for our clients because they don't want to, yes. right? Um, one of the advice I always give is like, you, you do still need to understand what's done in your business. You need to understand your anatomy, right? So if the business is a body, right, there is a nervous system in that body. That is your IT. You need to understand how it works. You don't need to be able to program it. It's like you know, driving your car. I don't need to know how my engine works but I do need to know how to get from A to B without causing you know, catastrophic accidents. Um, I'm a big advocate with all my clients, like, hey, if you're going to go down this route and we implement you know, the, the accounting system for you, you want to get an accountant, right? But for the first month, I want you to do the transactions as a business owner so you understand where to go. Yes, it's going to be painful, but that understanding is like, how does my expense flow into the general ledger account? Why is there a consequence if I do certain things? If you don't know how to read your trial balance is one thing, but if you also don't understand, like, well, I don't really know where it came from, right? Why is it moving like that? I have no idea. I don't even know what that account means. Um, those people tend to overextend themselves financially. And this is where I go with business. The purpose for business is to actually have an added value. Now, what's added value? That is... If you as a client are p- paying me more than the components of the job put together, that what it costs me. That's my added value. And if I don't understand the added value, that means I actually don't understand how it all composes, right? So people go in a situation of loss because they forget to do all the indirect costs. Like, oh, yeah, I calculated the building, I calculated the acoustic, I calculated this. Or how about your insurances? Oh, forgot about that. Um, the big one is super for cash flow. Like, oh, I paid the salaries already. Yeah? And all of a sudden, the pay I, PI by GV Health comes in and the super comes in. I, I don't have the money. Uh, GST and other uh, things. So I do believe that as a small business owner, we have to wear many hats in the beginning. And we tend to outsource a little bit too soon um, and therefore lack that understanding. 
Now, from a business landscape in Australia, right, and it's actually the same in any country, um, the small business is the, the, the motor of the economy, it's the engine room. This is where it happens. You know, the, the, the corporates get all the news, but they actually employ a small part of the population. Right? You really look at it, 80 to 90% of people are employed in small business, depending on the size of public sector, really. Um, how do you see the, the risks and the opportunities within Australia if you look at the division that we have between primary, secondary, and tertiary industry, so the, the, the agriculture and the mining, the, you know, the actual manufacturing of stuff from that directly, and then the servicing and trade industry after that, where do you see the risks and the opportunities for Australia um, going forward, and where do you think we should invest more in? That's an interesting question. I mean, you think about, um, talk about business and, and stuff, and you think every, every dollar that is earned is started by an entrepreneur. Every bit of tax that is paid was started by an entrepreneur having a go. So the, the sale has to happen mm-hmm. for the tax to be paid for all those other services to be funded. So small businesses and even large businesses, but the small business, the entrepreneur is responsible for the economy. Without their ideas, without them starting business, no dollar gets transacted, no tax gets paid from that perspective. So every dollar from a point of view, comes from uh, from an entrepreneur. Someone once said to me, I thought, oh, that's interesting. It's a good good thing to, to always think about. I think it, it, from a point of view of, of Australia, it comes down to where can we add value and what is the you know, what is the upgrade from primary to move to uh, you know, secondary or to, or to tertiary type aspects in terms of adding value. I think for us as a, um, as a country, it's a case of saying, well, how can we develop more of those high value added items that we can uh, obviously make more money out of from, from that perspective? It's, it's making sure that we've got the infrastructure, you think about globalisation and sometimes there's efficiencies, but we see sometimes supply chain issues can also, if you're offshore or if you're manufacturing, that can be a bit of a problem locally. So you've got to sort of think about a bit of a, a global feel but also a local aspect redundancy point of view. So from a, a point of view of, of the country, if, if we're investing more in those that tertiary stuff and the high-end value-added stuff, which is if we've got it starting here, we'll want to add value to it here before we export it, before we use it. And so it builds more opportunity and it, it puts us almost sometimes at the forefront of where it sits, but, but Australia also big on agriculture. We've got to make sure we don't dismiss all of that because we can play in both areas, maybe more in that value-added space, which then takes us forward and it has a lot more benefit around the education, all those elements, and, and people have a wow, an advancement aspect of what we want to do mm-hmm. uh, in our in our economy across the board because we've got to make sure that you're know, only a small country, but how do we compete on the, on the global scale? We don't want to export all of our expertise. We want to make sure we can also do some of it onshore here and we can grow from that point of view. So mm-hmm. I think a bit more area bit more growth in the yeah, the tertiary type industries yeah. would be great. Yeah. So we actually, we, we have a unique situation. We're a big land mass. We've got a lot of resources. Um, there is, you know, contrary, if you look at the general picture of Australia, oh, there's a big desert and there's coastline, but we do have a lot of arable land. Um, so we got the resources, we got the arable land. So the primary industry should be really, really good yes. here, right? So I do think it's a good hedge because without primary industry, secondary and tertiary industry is gone. Right, so if the economy collapses, we always need to have a primary industry. No matter what happens, because it's what you need. You need food. No matter what happens, you're gonna pay for your food. No matter what happens, you gotta manufacture some stuff. Right? It, it's just manufacturing. I believe is kind of a de-risker for our economy. Um, the s- secondary industry, so manufacturing is de-risker, but also national security. Right? We don't make enough here that if things go wrong in the world and it's getting a little bit less safe at the moment, um, we can't actually appropriate manufacturing to defend ourselves. Um, we closed all our car industries and all these things. So I do think um, other than the direct economic aspects of that, there is a national security part of it. Mm. Plus, um, by importing all these things, we do know we need them. So if people say, well, we didn't make the cars that people wanted to buy, like, well, maybe we should make cars that people wanted to buy for a price that they're willing to pay for it. Yeah. Because that actually employs then the tertiary industry. The biggest risk I see is like a lot of new businesses are in the tertiary industry. Um, most of them, <laughs> maybe it's because of the market I'm in, is a lot of them are either installing stuff or they're helping you sell stuff by marketing. I mean, marketing companies have been just exploding, eh? the SEOs and all that stuff. Um, I think I do think that's a risk because the first thing that you will cut as a business owner is m- expensive. You go like, hey, if I don't do this for a while, I can survive, right? If I don't pay my personnel, I cannot survive. If I... Do marketing in a cheaper way, I can survive. 
Um, so I do see there's a risk here, plus the industry transition, and maybe you'll see this as well. Let's go a little bit on the technology side with AI. There's a lot of things changing in AI. And it's one exciting, of, man. It, it's exciting, but it's a double-edged sword, right? It's, um, am I the Luddite that says, oh, if you put a train next to my cows, then the milk will turn sour? Um, because that was the big thing when the real world started, like the milk will turn sour. Well, that kind of didn't happen. There are some other things, and there's always intended consequences of things, and there's the unintended ones. And people don't never talk about the unintended ones. So for instance, with AI, I um, was talking to someone in the SEO industry. He's like, well, actually, I need to change my whole business because SEO is going to be meaningless if AI is now powering your search engine, right? Because it's no longer categorized search. Before we categorize our search, yeah? like how you put emails in your folders, and now we search the email, why would you put them in a folder? Yeah. Um, so I do see it as a big shakeup. With AI, I see a number of this, but interesting to see you, um, what you see in realized business and the trends with AI, and what are the opportunities that people see? Yep. But also, where do you say, hey, here's a bit of a warning for you. Be careful on the AI, if, if you have them. So I think this is interesting. So I look at it that you think small business competing with large business. So digital, normalize that. So small businesses can now compete with large business with the types of technology that are available. So digital has allowed that to happen. AI will amplify that. So that it's it's coming. So the whole point is, you can say, oh, I'm, 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 it's, I'm going to avoid it, but it's here, it's coming. Yeah, people are using it. It's, it's more around change management. The thing that's interesting from a, an AI perspective, but if you think not necessarily about the future, just right now with what technically is available, there was a... I think the CSIRO did a report that said the next wave of digital that's coming is going to add about 10 to $15 trillion to global GDP. However, in Australia, if you just... So Australia, GDP is about $1.5 trillion, small business can do about 30% of that, it's about $500 billion. If we were to able pro, to properly implement and take advantage of current technology, not new technology, not the new, new current technology then we'd be able to add to the Australian GDP between 140 and $250 billion. Mm-hmm. Huge opportunity, 20% type a- aspect a- uplift in GDP. So if you think about it from a small business point of view, small businesses out there saying, okay, if I can properly take advantage of the technical aspects and opportunities that are there and implement in my business, I can get my own uplift in my own small business. And this is where the opportunity for AI is, but also potential the challenge is – what I would call effective deployment. Talk about shiny objects before. You say, oh, people are shiny. So there's this new app that's out. Oh, I'm going to get an idea. People, interestingly enough, someone says someone mentions an app. They'll people download it, and it, if it takes more than you know five seconds to download while it's coming around and downloading, we're getting impatient. Because um, interestingly enough, uh, I'll get back to that. <laughs> but but interesting enough, you know, because we want it, we want it now. Um, if I if I look at it from the point of view, we're now a society of instant. And I was talking to a, a friend of mine once. I was at a as a, at a emceeing an event and she said to me that she has fast food stores and she said nobody wants I said look nobody wants fast food anymore and she said oh wow you're going to kill my business I said no it's not about that I said nobody wants fast food every person expects instant food if you go through that drive through and you want to get your order and they say oh, can you wait 30 seconds I said, wait a minute wait 30 seconds I want it now so everyone wants instant gratification now we want instant delivery mm-hmm. so when we go back and say I download the app, I want it to start up and I start using it straight away. Do I fully understand it? Probably not, but I start. And I think this is the, the challenge that we have and also opportunities is understanding what are all the opportunities in AI. They're, they're going to keep growing and growing. But making the ability to say the opportunity and filter to go, this is for my business. This is how it's going to work in my business. This is how I understand it, the training, and it's how I effectively deploy it. Because if we don't effectively deploy it, then what we'll end up doing is deleting it. And when I look at ideas and I go, okay, someone has – talk about ideas. Yeah, starting and finishing is the key things in mm-hmm. anything in life. If you don't have any ideas, well, you never start. But the problem is people have ideas, download an app, and they start but never fully implement. Then what never could be will be. So they've wasted all that time yep. and resource. So the big there's a huge opportunity in AI. We can get great efficiencies, uplifts in productivity in business. But the real key thing is saying, okay, let's have a look at all of these opportunities in my business. Forget all the macro stuff and all that, but just in my business. 
here's my functions. This is what I do. Is there an AI app to help me with financing my business? Is there an AI to help me with HR, my operations, my marketing? Yeah. So what are those for me? Fully understand them, then effectively deploy them. But if you don't effectively deploy, then I'm getting back to the people have discussions, they make those decisions, then they get distracted with the new app. Mm -hmm. The key is have the discussions, make the decisions on what app is for you or what technology is for you and then get it done and fully implemented in your business. Yeah. To me, that's the – that's the so AI has huge opportunity, but I can see a lot of wasted time. Most people are just playing with it at the moment, mm -hmm. having a go, that looks nice, but are they fully integrating it into their business? Maybe they don't know how, that second one. If I have discussions, I make the decisions I want to, but I don't know how. It's a new tool in the toolbox, but it's actually making nothing that I want, so let's yeah. see what I can make with it. Um, I, I actually see a number of risks in AI. I do see you know, it's inevitable. Right, that's number one, it's inevitable, it's gonna happen, it's happening already. Risk number one is I can't name any AI, right, that is Australian, that is made here, trained here using, you know, our data set, because who controls the training controls the outcome. That's with a large language model, you train it on particular data and they talk all about bias and we need to prevent bias by implementing bias. In other words, bias is okay as long as it's our bias and you don't, you don't control that. Uh, number two is we start treating it like an employee almost. My AI wrote my blog. Okay, did you proofread it? Did you know what was actually written there? Because it can be hallucinating. This is another thing, right? AI hallucinates. It just makes up stuff and we don't know why. And when I got really concerned about AI, I was still working at Microsoft. I read this article that um, the Facebook translation engine, which is an AI, <laughs> invented a whole new language as an intermediate between two languages that it actually couldn't translate directly. So it just created a middle language by itself and the Facebook team that actually managed it didn't understand it. They didn't understand the logic why it did it. So if you're having a machine that does stuff that you don't understand, then I wouldn't be trusting it because I, it's a machine. A machine by definition should have no desires, no purpose, they just run code. As soon as they have desires and a purpose or they start being innovative or hallucinating, they're like, okay, what's actually really happening here? Can I control this? Can I trust what's coming out of it? What's the trading model? Um, I believe it's um, from from Australia. We need to invest in our own AI. And, and training. You mentioned that whole. That, it goes back to that model of basic awareness, working knowledge, and leading edge. Yeah. You don't implement something you don't have a basic awareness about, mm. and that's the challenge. So people say, "I just got to do it." So the yeah. key is understand it, and then implement it. So that the whole and look, the whole we got to be aware of new technology and what all that means. Don't be shy, but play with it understand where it sits, and then adopt it in, in the full aspect from an integration point of view into your business. So I'm not saying avoid it because the whole idea is you, you'll, you'll never get perfect. Be aware of it. it. Just have, yeah. Be aware, have that basic awareness of what are the pitfalls, what are the opportunities, and what are the risks with it, with having that part of my business. But don't avoid it. Don't avoid and don't just say, oh, I'll just get Matt to implement it. Hmm. If I have no idea about it, that's not good business uh, risk yeah. um, governance, and I think you need to look at it from that perspective. Yeah. I say embrace it see how you can use it, but have an awareness of it, but fully understand it and then implement it and get the most out of it. Yeah. Don't waste all your time. Yeah. Just an interesting tip. I was just reading uh, one of the articles at Canva is um, limiting the investment in AI at the moment. They're actually turning it back a little bit because it's negative implications for, for the industry. Um, and that's another thing. So obviously as a SSL partner, I read what Sridhar Vambu is saying, and he's also saying like, well, we try not to implement AI to replace people. We can augment them. So AI, we don't train it to write code for us um, because he, it, it's other than from an employment perspective, is ultimately we need something to do, but also from a creativity perspective because an AI is a learning model and it will figure out something that's very interesting, right? It will do something very interesting, but the actual true innovation, um, the divine spark that we have um, I'm not trusting a computer has it and I believe that what he is going for as well. It's like, okay, we still need to have people make things for people. Um, but allow people yeah. to be more creative. Yeah. So you think about this. When do you get your best ideas? And when I'm in the shower, when I'm going for a walk, when I'm not thinking about all those tasks that I have to do. Correct. So if AI can help me alleviate those tasks and give me more thinking time, then I'll get more insights and I get more ideas. So there's potentially an opportunity where my creativity with the support of AI can actually grow. I think that's a key point because um, Einstein worked in the patent office doing very mundane work when he was actually doing the very mundane work. He was thinking his big thoughts. Yeah. 
right? So if we can outsource the mundane things and control, obviously you need to know what it's doing. The same as if you outsource to your accountant or outsource your social media marketing to overseas, um, which is, you know, virtual assistance is kind of a thing um, a couple of years ago, I think still is. Um, you still have to be in control. What's actually happening? What are they doing? How do I check that they're not taking my account, hijacking it? All these things. With an AI, you need to do the same thing. Delegate, don't abdicate. Yeah. 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 The whole point is you still got to have responsibility for what it does. Yeah. I think that's yeah. the key difference. Yeah. You're still in control. Yeah. You still need to be in control. Yeah. You can't delegate accountability. No. Right. And as a CEO of a business, no matter how large it is, you can't say, Let's, sorry, I, it wasn't me. <laughs> I thought the buck stops there. It Correct. is you. Um, so that's actually very interesting. What other, I mean, obviously we've seen trends come in and out of business, right? So um, just you know, a few months ago, uh, it was um, uh, the, the Facebook equivalent to Twitter, what was it called? Threads? Threads, yes. Right? It's even Zuckerberg left it now, right? So there are certain things that are hyped up and actually not a trend. When do you believe a small business should jump on something, immediately try it out, to go full in? Or do you say, hey, just hold on a second, see what's happening? Who are the most successful ones? The ones that jump on it? the ones that wait and see, or kind of maybe both like, hey, I, I'm trying it out and see how it goes. What is your... Look, it's, interesting. it's your own risk governance aspect. Mm. It's, it's interesting. I, I do this thing and I talk about being decisive. Uh, it's interesting. It's an interesting question. I can't tell you when you should jump into something. That's for you to determine from your business. All I say is you've got to know, you've got to make decisions. If you're a person that's going to embrace it for you, then understand the risk of being at the start. There's going to be some changes. There needs to be some updates. There's going to be some bugs versus those that wait and say, I'll wait till it's fully t tested. And I remember this is one issue. I've, I've had used to do some things where I would talk at schools and talk about uh -huh. the whole idea. Because interesting at schools, and we'd go and talk to year 10, year 11, year 12 students and would have the whole idea of business owners are scary. Bosses are scary to them. Yeah. So we'd have these days where we'd go and say, let's talk about mindset. How could you prepare to go into the workforce? Also have a lunch. And we'd bring business owners in to talk with students so they can start to familiarise and say it's not too scary, actually, you're just like me, it's okay, I can. But more importantly, you went to this school, you're doing that now, maybe I can too, give some belief system for them. One of the parts of the day is to talk about being decisive. And so I, I use this thing where I have a box of Cadbury favourites, chocolates. Mm -hmm. And I stand up there and I say, look, I'm going to, I'm going to get fit while I'm on an exercise plan. And I got given this box of chocolates and I can't eat them. And then I hold them up. And in the room, you can see people going, I'll have them, pass them over here. I'll take them off you. And they're saying those things. And I just keep saying it, I can't eat them. And it's waiting for one of the students to click the says, if I want that opportunity, I'm going to get up out of my seat and I've got to walk across and take that. Now, that's a vulnerable walk. Things could go wrong. I could be told to sit back down. And they come along and they take them out of my hand. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, Congratulations. And Cadbury Favourites comes in two sizes. There's a large size and there's another little size. So then I, uh, everyone says, yeah, then I reach back into my bag and I pull out the half size of Cadbury Favourites yeah. and I hold it up. I said, I can't eat these ones either. And it's interesting, all the people <laughs> that come and then grab them out of my hand. And then I've got nothing left. So it's really interesting to say you know, those that take the risk can get the bigger reward. So they had the big chocolates and they can then hand it out. And then it gets smaller and eventually there might be nothing. So really it's up to someone in their own business to understand their risk profile, mm. saying, well, okay, it could go a lot wrong if I'm getting it at the start, but maybe there's a bigger reward if I'm you know, early adopters and I get in and off I go. If I want to wait till the end, maybe the reward is a lot less and it just becomes the norm. So to me it's not about when you get in or where it's just there's different risks and you've got to understand from yourself from a business where does it sit, but you have to make a decision. When it gets presented, if it's for me, take it. If it's not for me, say no, thank you, and, and, and move, move on. on. Yeah. Yeah, the key here is there'll always be this new stuff because you you think about you have your new idea. You want to go out and tell, hey, I've got this new business, <laughs> this new idea. You want to get customers excited about it because you're excited about it. You want them to get excited. So you need those people who want to help. That for, what a, um, There's a great um, YouTube thing around the first follower, the whole idea. It's a, it's a music festival where uh -huh. there's a guy dancing. He's just dancing on the side of a hill and someone narrates it and he's, everyone else is sitting down. And then someone else gets up and starts dancing with him. So he's no longer, no longer looks stupid. There's another, he's got his first follower. 
and the next person comes up and they start. To, and pretty soon, other people start jumping up and following. So those that were sitting down now look like they're out of place. Yes. And they've now got to jump up and join in. And so likewise in business, it's really up to us. All I get back to is there'll always be so many different ways to do your business, mm -hmm. new opportunities, new technologies. You've got to look at it, assess it, and understand the risk. If it's new, it's going to have more bugs. But it might also, if it works, and when it works, it takes me ahead of the competition in where that sits. So to me, I can't tell you which to adopt and when to adopt. You have to look at it from your own business. All I say is make some decisions and, where, and how it works for you. Yeah. Just one more question before we wrap it up. But um, I notice you, you, know, you speak very well. Uh, you're also Toastmasters. I am. Right? Is that something that you say like every small business owner actually needs to do something like Toastmasters, be comfortable speaking? Um, what's the recommendation there? And and do you see actually small businesses that are part of your, you know, the realized business clientele, that you go like, well, it's quite obvious that they need to present themselves better. So what's your, your view on that and how has it helped you? Toastmasters helped me immensely. I would say any person who's looking to improve their engagement, their public speaking in any way, should look to do something like Toastmasters. That's not to be Toastmasters. I recommend Toastmasters, something that I do. Because you look at it from – so Toastmasters is, is interesting. It's, it's broken up. It's about building your confidence. It's also about got some great leadership aspects of running meetings and running your groups and things like that. From a point of view of improving people's ability to communicate, there's two pathways. There's a way in which you can do presentations. There's also this thing called table topics or impromptu speaking mm -hmm. because you never know – when you are going to be asked for your opinion or you want to give your opinion. Wouldn't it be nice if you can do a lot of practice in a way in which you can develop those skills so when you're asked a question, you can say, I'll give an answer in a structured, succinct way. So it's about building people's confidence. I thoroughly enjoy Toastmasters. I go in some of the competitions, which is nice, but I'm always challenging myself from a point of view of being sharp. It's my practice ground. I get to do it behind closed doors. Even if, if I've got an idea... And I say, okay, what if I look at this? Say you've got a, a presentation, you've got a job interview you want to go to. Um, you want to do a presentation to a client for a very, very important presentation that might win you a big contract. You go and practice it in your Toastmasters group and then you polish it. So then when you go and give it in the job interview or give it in that presentation, then you are more confident. One of the, What's interesting is you and I are having a conversation or people have many conversations every day. Mm. And I say, now, let's put you on a stage with 100 people watching you and they can't talk. But we talk every day. Yeah. It's purely and simply <laughs> a mental thing and we have great conversations every day. So Toastmasters builds that confidence for people in terms of grades. I recommend every person should look at it. It doesn't matter whether you think you're really good because you can always learn more. Those, but the best thing is when someone comes in to a Toastmaster meeting and they, they're afraid, we say, would you like to get up and talk? They'll get up and they'll talk for two seconds or five seconds and they'll sit down. Then after a period of time you see them grow, they get up to 10 seconds. Then they get up to, to half a minute, then a minute, and eventually they're doing a speech. That growth is wonderful to see. And every person can do that in a safe environment. So I think Toastmasters is a, is a great place that people should go to grow themselves and their confidence. Yeah. For me, it's every business, every role you have, um, and, and I say this to you know, anyone that works with me, you always have an aspect of selling. Yes. Um, even though you're not selling. So if you're a consultant, you go, oh, no, someone else sells for me. I just do the whole thing. No, you're selling your concept. You're selling your ideas. Yes. If you're in development, you're selling the way you develop an application. If you're building a, a, a piece of equipment, you're selling this is the best way to do it. I mean, you, you always are selling, otherwise you're being sold too. And one of the things that I notice is that a lot of great ideas, they stop because the person selling the idea is utterly unengaging, doesn't read the room, even though it could be the best thing since sliced bread, maybe even better, um, or the most um, uh, influential invention of mankind known to us. It's, by the way, not the wheel, it's grain, right? It's cultivated grain. Um, it could be that. If you can't you know, help someone else convince themselves, like, hey, this is actually something I need, um, the message gets lost, right? It, it, yeah. I'd agree. Look, I was once talking to the world champion of public speaking. There's a competition you can go yeah. into. And I met, went to a met him at a conference and I asked him a question. I said, Jock, what's the one bit of advice that you could give me when it comes to public speaking or, or speaking in general presentations? He said, Marty, nobody cares what matters to you. 
It's because that matters to you and doesn't, doesn't, mm. that's it. Nobody really cares what matters to you. He said, but don't lose that. He said, what's important is, is to say what matters to you in ways that matter to your audience. And that's the ability. If you can connect through storytelling or whatever it is, that whatever you're saying is important, it's got to matter to the audience and it'll connect. So say what matters to you in ways that matter to your audience and then you have that connection. I think that's a wonderful um, way to close this segment here. Let's uh, just for the final bit, how do people get in touch with you? Where do they can find out the Realize Business and, um, and, and, and other programs that you run with Realize Business as well? Uh, so just look up Realize Business and you can connect with us obviously through, through the website. Uh, from that point, we have a number of different programs. So we're fortunate to run the New South Wales Government's Business Connect program where uh, for Central Sydney, which is any person who's in small business, pretty much less than 20 employees, can get access to advice that the government will pay for uh, for any parts of business, any functions of business. We're also running the Federal Government's Digital Solutions Program, which is about improving the digital capability and confidence and that implementation in this new digital world. And we do that for all of New South Wales and ACT. And any small business in New South Wales and the ACT can access those programs, and that's funded by the federal government. We also have our own other bespoke programs where people, if they've got particular needs in particular functions, can also come along, masterminds, other opportunities to grow their businesses as well. So the whole idea is I su suggest come to our Realised Business website, have a look at it, get in touch with us, let us sit down and have a conversation with you because together we can work out maybe what programs that you need or if it's not for us, we can put you in touch with other organisations uh, that can, can go and do that. Um, the one thing that I would leave with and say is that uh, my mum always said something to me when I was younger. She said, Martin, you're already rich and someday you may have money. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Martin. So uh, does Martin Rogers Realize Business? We'll put all the links that Martin mentioned um, earlier below this video. Uh, do reach out if you're in New South Wales, in particular in Sydney area, but in New South Wales for the Digital Solutions Program as well as Realize Business. And good luck with your journey. Thanks, man. Thank you.